I would like to now introduce um, our CDC director, Dr. Tom Frieden, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for being here. This is a, a great event. We have the Langmuir Lecture. I think of it as really uh, the keystone event of each year's EIS conference. Uh, last year, Jeff Dean challenged us all to open data more for the public domain, and I think we need to make more progress in that area, uh, but it's a good marker to have set. So um, I'm really uh, delighted. Uh, as you know, Alexander Langmuir founded the EIS program. We are all in some very important conceptual and philosophical ways descendants of Langmuir in the work that we do. The work that says we don't do things because we always did them that way. We don't do things because someone told, them, told us to do it that way. We do things because that's where the data drives us. Now, um, I'm also absolutely delighted to introduce Dr. Margaret Hamburg as the Langmuir Lecture Honoree for this 65th annual EIS conference. Dr. Hamburg is an internationally recognized leader. She currently uh, is the Foreign Secretary for the National Academy of Medicine, formerly the Institute of Medicine. She, as you know, most recently was Commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration, where at the beginning of her term, she set a clear marker that she was going to further infuse a public health perspective into the Food and Drug Administration, and she absolutely did that. I can say without a moment's hesitation that the interactions between CDC and FDA are more positive today than they have ever been in the past, and that's to a great extent because of Dr. Hamburg's leadership. And because of that, we're able to do a lot more together than we could do uh, as individual agencies. She was known for advancing regulatory science, modernizing regulatory pathways, and increasing the globalization and reach of the agency, uh, most fundamentally committing to infusing that public health perspective. Before this, she was the founding vice president and senior scientist at the Nuclear Threat Initiative, a foundation dedicated to reducing nuclear, chemical, and biological threats. She also is previously assistant secretary for planning and evaluation at HHS, and I will say, perhaps most importantly to me, my first boss as uh, the uh, commissioner of the New York City Health Department, a wonderful health department which uh, Peggy led wonderfully for many years. I have always found her to be an invaluable source of advice, wisdom, kindness, intelligence, and knowledge. Uh, her title today is From Antibiotic Resistance to Zika, Reflections on Working at the Intersection of Science and Public Health Politics. Now, I will say, uh, Peggy and I have both worked in New York City, at the national level in the US and globally, and public health is like politics, to a great extent, the art of the possible. This is an intersection that is both one of the most fascinating and one of the most frustrating parts of our job, uh, but it's one that we can't ignore, because as Bill Fagy said last night at International Night, every public health decision is at some level a political decision, and therefore our role is to ensure that the likelihood that the right decision is made is maximized. Uh, the common thread there is that we need to ensure that the right information gets to the right people in the right format at the right time so that the right decision will be made. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Hamburg to CDC. So thank you very much. I appreciate that kind introduction and uh, it really is a great pleasure to be here. I'm very honored to be giving the Alex Lamier lecture and to participate in what I understand is the 65th annual EIS conference. That is an impressive number, still slightly older than I am today. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity for me to recognize the importance of the work that all of you do and also to reflect a bit on uh, my career in public health. And I probably won't um, get quite as much into some of the behind the scene politics as might be fun, but I, I still want to be discreet. Um, I understand that the overarching theme of this year's conference has been data for action. Starting with Dr. Frieden's opening remarks as the conference began, I understand, earlier this week. And of course, you know, this is such an appropriate and essential focus. 
and it's one that I know that Alec Langmer surely would have approved of. His career was characterized by his commitment to scientific rigor, strict standards for data generation and analysis, and the importance of disseminating and acting on public health information. And as you likely know, his first great contribution to the fledgling CDC way back in the late 1940s and early 1950s was to bring new rigor to malaria control activities here in the southern United States, which was then the priority of the organization. And he insisted that malaria cases be reported on the basis of positive blood smears, enabling the program to be built on a foundation of accurate, meaningful data for action. And so he solved the malaria problem, and then he went on to define for the nation and really for the world the critical need and role for skilled epidemiologists to respond to public health threats, great and small. And of course, he began the now much revered Epidemic Intelligence Service. The EIS program commands a very special role in public health, and you all belong to a very special and influential club. I will confess that early in my career, I almost applied. Don't know if they would have taken me, but before doing so, I had the opportunity to meet with the late Carl Tyler, who I think was then the head of the epidemiology program. I wanted to learn more, and I inquired about whether, if accepted, I could do my training in the Northeast because my boyfriend, now husband, was working in New York and he wasn't all that enthusiastic about moving just anywhere. His response was not encouraging. Actually, he looked me right in the eye and said that if he had anything to do with it, if I asked for a specific region, I would almost certainly not be assigned to go there. <laughs> so I guess that they like to toughen you up in this program, uh, but at least he was honest. So I never made that special journey from clinician scientist to epidemiologist, but I've always felt a kinship to and a deep appreciation for your work. And I'll admit, that some of my best friends are epidemiologists, <laughs> wonderful, outstanding members of your ranks. And somewhere along the arc of my career, I did assimilate the critical concept that not everything that was important for health happened in a clinic or a hospital, and that populations, as distinguished from patients, were important. When I first became health commissioner in New York City, my great aunt Winnie, who was sort of like a grandmother to me, was very disturbed that I was throwing away my medical career to become commissioner. Why can't she just be a real doctor, she complained to my father. He tried to assure her that I was still a real doctor, but now I had some eight million patients. She didn't feel all that much better, um, but I came to understand in profound ways what that really meant. And when years later I moved on to the role of Commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration, I gained new insights, just as I also gained several hundred million more patients. So as I speak with you this morning, I want to build on the theme of data for action and address some of the public health challenges I've faced over the course of my career and some of those that lie before us. I know that Alex Langmuir believed in brief, polished presentations followed by equal time for discussion. I look forward to our discussion, but please forgive me that my comments may not meet Dr. Langmuir's standards for precision and scientific rigor. Though perhaps after you've had a full week of such presentations, you may be ready for a somewhat less structured approach, and I don't intend to show a single slide. <laughs> I guess that I really have to begin with a story about data for action that was truly formative for me in my career, and I dare say for Tom Frieden as well. I do like to tease him by saying that I gave him his first real job in public health, launching what has been and will continue to be a brilliant career. He probably would have done okay without me, but I still do like to take credit. And this story, I think, is a great illustration of a number of things that I want to talk with you about this morning, and it relates back to the work that uh, Alex Langmuir did with malaria. 
In the early 1990s, when I first became health commissioner, New York City had one of the highest case rates of TB in the country. In fact, five times the national average, and New York City accounted for close to 18% of the nation's total cases. Notably, case rates had been increasing since 1979, but somehow this had been barely addressed as the city grappled with the growing challenge of HIV AIDS, which though intimately intertwined with TB, seemed to overshadow the threat of TB itself. But a smart, enterprising EIS officer working in the department noticed this problem and wanted to learn more. He undertook a study documenting a one-month sample of TB cases in New York. He looked at the sputum and found that the rates of drug resistance were astoundingly high. Forgive me, Tom, if I don't get the numbers quite right. But the data showed that nearly half of patients previously treated for TB were resistant to one or more drugs, and nearly one-third were resistant to isoniazid and rifampin. Among patients with first-time TB, nearly one-quarter were resistant to one or more drugs, and about 7% were resistant to isoniazid and rifampin. It was clear that the treatment regimens we were routinely using were increasingly ineffective and, in fact, were likely making things worse. Needless to say, I was profoundly impressed by this data and the action needed. I was also impressed by the young man who did this pivotal study, Tom Frieden, of course. He was finishing up with EIS, and I quickly hired him to direct the city's tuberculosis control program. Strikingly, before he took the job on, the position was part-time. Just one reflection of the fact that TB was then viewed, data notwithstanding, as a declining public health problem, and a real complacency had taken hold. With Tom's new evidence in hand, we were able to mobilize. The magnitude and urgency of the problem was clear, and the New York Post headline screaming, killer TB on the subway, helped us as well, but it was a little less scientific and uh, perhaps a bit more sensational. Looking back, I think it's fair to say that when Tom accepted my job offer, he probably didn't fully appreciate what he was getting himself into. That full-time job turned into a round-the-clock battle against a growing epidemic. But no doubt it was good preparation for Ebola and Zika and so much more. And it certainly, I think, affected um, my thinking about public health, and I suspect his as well. As we set out, many were discouraging. Wise people in the world of public health cautioned me that we'd make little progress because TB was so associated with poverty and the underserved. If we couldn't cure poverty, we couldn't cure TB. But we were able to put in place a well-designed, data-driven strategy with a comprehensive approach, adequate resources, and real political backing from the mayor on down. It took political and public health leadership. It took an integrated systems approach that engaged the homeless shelters and jails and prisons just as much as the city's physicians, clinics, and hospitals so that patients needing treatment didn't fall through the cracks. And it took a blueprint for action that clearly defined priorities, goals, and objectives, and the specific responsibilities of the various players involved. And after only a few years, we were able to see the TB numbers in the city plunge. In fact, I think far more quickly and dramatically than we had ever really imagined. Over a five-year period, I believe, the TB cases dropped overall by about 46% and some 86% for resistant strains. The complacency and mistaken assumptions that led to the TB resurgence and the lessons we learned in developing and implementing a comprehensive treatment and control plan remain, for better or for worse, just as relevant today as they were more than 20 years ago. And now, after many years of working at the perilous intersection of science, medicine, public health, and politics, particularly in New York City and then at the FDA, I've had a lot of opportunity to grapple with difficult problems and the chance to learn, sometimes by disaster, a lot about how to tra traverse complex landscapes and sometimes stormy seas. From early on, I gained some important insights, obvious ones, like the fact that not everyone's going to like you. 
I quickly developed a thick skin and a strong stomach, I would say. To, I learned to try to always communicate clearly and honestly, but also to listen, to surround myself with good people and to seek out the expertise needed. Correspondingly, to never be afraid to acknowledge what I didn't know. You may have to ask awkward questions, but you have to get the best information you need for the decisions at hand. And always, always, always to use the best available science and evidence to inform your actions. As I was reflecting on this meeting and what I might talk about, I came across an article written several years ago by Harvey Feinberg, a former dean of the Harvard School of Public Health and immediate past president of the National Academy of Medicine, what was formerly known as the Institute of Medicine. And as Tom mentioned, I'm now serving part-time as the foreign secretary for that organization. And so I took a special interest when this article called The Deadly Sins and Living Virtues of Public Health crossed my desk. It begins with a more historical, in fact, ecclesiastical reference to the seven deadly sins of lust, sloth, gluttony, greed, wrath, envy, and pride, quoting Pope Gregory I in 590 AD as his source. But he quickly moves on to the modern era, using this litany as a foil to suggest that there are also seven deadly sins of public health. He kept three of the original sins, sloth, greed, and gluttony, but he added four more, ignorance, complacency, timidity, and obstinacy. And I suspect that we could all come up with other candidates to replace or add to the list. But being an optimist at heart, Harvey suggested that we might also think about whether there are seven or more living virtues for public health that can serve as a counterweight to the deadly sins. He suggested some candidates, moderation, prevention, preparedness, empathy, science, and service. To that list, I'd like to add integrity. For me, integrity is such an essential foundation for everything else. Integrity of leadership, integrity of systems, integrity of science and data, of course, and integrity of actions. The late Senator Kennedy once said that integrity is the lifeblood of democracy. I think that is true, and I think it's also the lifeblood of what we do in public health, what we must stand for, and how we must act. While at FDA, I had many occasions to think hard about these issues. To be honest, when I began at the FDA, I did not appreciate the full dimensions and demands of the job, the vast scope of the responsibilities, the diversity of highly engaged stakeholders, the competing priorities, the limited resources, the fishbowl environment in which FDA works, the complexity of the science required, and the growing complexity of the products we were responsible for overseeing, not just the science and engineering of the products, but also the increasingly complex and global supply chains that they followed from initial development and production into our homes and hospitals. As I quickly came to understand, the FDA is charged with an enormous and significant task to promote and protect the health of the American people, and increasingly people all over the world. It's a science-based, data-driven regulatory agency with a public health mission. The responsibilities include efforts to ensure the safety, effectiveness, and quality of human and animal drugs, vaccines, medical devices, the safety of the blood supply, oversight of cosmetics and dietary supplements, as well as the safety and wholesomeness of the vast majority of our nation's food supply, including nutrition-related standards and guidance. And during my tenure, FDA also took on the regulation of tobacco products. All in all, FDA regulates products that account for between 20 and 25 cents of every consumer dollar spent on products in the United States, and products that people really rely on in fundamental and often life-saving ways. The agency's mission also includes working proactively to foster scientific innovation that will lead to new, better products and enhance the safety and benefits of products that are already in the marketplace. And in addition, FDA is charged with providing accurate, clear, and actionable information to the public about these products and their use. 
It's been said that no other agency in the federal government touches more American lives every day more often than the FDA in every American home, at every table, in every medicine chest, in every hospital, pharmacy, grocery store, doctor's office, school cafeteria, restaurant, and distribution chain along the way from all around the globe. It is a lot. To again quote the late Senator Kennedy, one of our nation's greatest champions of health, he once said that the FDA is the most important health agency in America. And I suspect that some of you in this room are, you know, wondering about that a bit, you know. Absolutely, the CDC plays an essential and critical role, and you've co-opted the tagline, working 24-7 to protect America from health and safety threats. But the truth is that we're all in it together, and there's more than enough work for everyone, and we're all more effective when we work together. I think we must also share a relentless focus on and commitment to the integrity of our work in all its many aspects. Certainly, while I was at the FDA, I was struck by the fact that building and maintaining trust and confidence in the agency, in our integrity, had to be the linchpin of everything we did. Unfortunately, when I took over the helm at FDA, public confidence in my agency had taken a number of serious hits as Congress and the media had really piled on following a series of drug safety concerns and foodborne outbreaks, and as the agency grappled with the impact of decades long underfunding. One thing I learned was that when people did not understand the FDA or its actions, they often assumed the worst. Only by really explaining what we do, how we do it, and why could we foster that necessary trust even in times of conflict or controversy. We worked hard to promote a culture of greater openness, shaping an agency that took its leadership role seriously, listened to our stakeholders, and endeavored to foster integrity and clarity in all our systems, procedures, and working relationships, as well as in our decisions. But earning and maintaining the trust and confidence of the American people and the FDA must also be inextricably linked to real integrity in the science that underlies the work. The public and policymakers must understand that FDA makes decisions based on the best available evidence. This is not always easy, but frankly, when trying to navigate complicated waters buffeted by politics, stakeholder pressures, and so much more, knowing that science and data must be your North Star is the only thing that keeps you on course. It may not always endear you to your colleagues or satisfy adversaries, of course. Unfortunately for me, I often had to take visible stands, sometimes at odds with the Department of Health and Human Services or the White House or Congress. I certainly did shed some considerable blood in the halls of Congress, um, but I didn't regret it because the principles were real as were the implications for patients, consumers, and public health. Plan B was one such example. This was the so-called morning after pill, which had actually been the subject of controversy and cries of political intrusion when the Bush administration failed to act. It came back to FDA while I was there with additional studies done to support the application to be sold over the counter to females of childbearing age. The data and studies met the criteria for approval, and approval was the FDA's unwavering recommendation. However, with other considerations in mind, the FDA decision was overruled. The intrusion of politics, once again, I'm afraid. But the Secretary of Health and Human Services had the legal authority to make the final decision. Yet it was an action with few precedents and to my mind, worrisome on many levels. At the time, some thought that I should resign in protest, but my calculus was that I had to make my position clear, defend it, but stay on to help the agency through other important issues and other battles that I knew would come. The good news was that I was allowed to publicly define the position of the FDA 
and no other science was produced to counter the scientific determination the FDA had made. And in fact, a court decision subsequently led to Plan B becoming available over the counter as we had recommended. But speaking frankly, what was additionally troubling to me were comments from the White House that included the observation that FDA should use a quote unquote common sense criteria for regulatory decisions. I understood what they were getting at, but really, whose common sense? And in this political season, I think the thought is particularly frightening. <laughs> so I dare say that one person's common sense standard might be another person's poison, and for the FDA, that might, in fact, be literally. The episode passed, but it was a reminder to me how in so many important areas of public health, it can be easy to say, just follow the science, but mightily hard to do. How fragile is the hold sometimes? And you can see the slippery slope. Certainly, reality demands flexibility, but we must be honest about what needs to be done and address it based on data, not what is comfortable or politically desirable or opportune, and not what the loudest voice in the room demands. During my career, reproductive health, sex education, violence prevention, and HIV AIDS have all provided complicated challenges where science and what really matters for people had to be the guidepost, but the going has often been rough. The same is true for issues like trans fat and sodium reduction or obesity and tobacco prevention and control where the concerns and stakeholders may be rather different, but the pressures no less forceful. In this context, I want to say a little about science at the FDA. One of my top priorities as commissioner was to support and strengthen science, both within our walls and through engagement with the broader scientific community. When I first arrived, I was amazed by the quality of the FDA scientists and their dedication. But it was also striking how much more needed to be done to enable them to undertake their important work. To be honest, many on the outside, including budget appropriators, but also some research advocates as well, really think that science at the FDA is mainly checklist science, rotely going through the sundry requirements and standards for a product review. But really, it is just so much more. It requires a real depth of understanding and breadth of knowledge to assess whether an intervention works, to assess the risks and benefits, to evaluate short-term impact and long-term effects. It requires real skill to help ensure a streamlined and effective research and development plan to foster the timely but scientifically rigorous study of a candidate product and its translation from bench to bedside or from farm to fork. FDA scientists must truly understand what it takes to move from a good idea to a real world product that yes, will bring positive benefits to the people who use it, but also that is stable, reproducible, and can be reliably scaled up, manufactured, and used. Strong science-driven regulations uh, also require the ability to respond to changing situations, new information, and new challenges. We can't have a one-size-fits-all approach, but we must always bring the best possible science to bear. While always fundamental, this comes into stark relief when confronting an emerging crisis, such as we recently dealt with, with Ebola and now, of course, with Zika. How do you responsibly move promising and much-needed products drugs, vaccines, diagnostics, protective gear, et cetera, that are still in the earliest stages of development and testing out to the populations who desperately need them? And how do you undertake the necessary research logistically, ethically, and with appropriate scientific integrity and rigor? I think we've learned a lot, but this is an arena of scientific work capacity building and collaboration that still urgently needs to be developed and refined. 
And where success will require that we work in teams across disciplines and sectors, across levels and agencies of government, and across nations. And in my view, both the crisis setting and routine needs demand that we advance regulatory science, the knowledge and tools necessary for the meaningful and timely review of products for safety, efficacy, quality, and performance, and to inform more efficient product development. We need to combine greater understanding of the underlying mechanisms of disease and human biology with new technologies and scientific advances in this effort, including such important areas of R&D as predictive toxicology, identification and validation of biomarkers, innovative clinical trial designs, and bioinformatics, including modeling and data mining. Such efforts can help us leverage opportunities for innovation and more quickly close the gap between scientific discovery and real-world products that will make a difference for people and for public health. Yet it's a component of our overall scientific enterprise that has been dangerously underappreciated, underdeveloped, and underfunded. It isn't generally sexy discovery research for NIH to fund. And companies have been reluctant to take on broad studies, which can be expensive, time-consuming, or risky when they need to focus on the specific products they're developing. But at the end of the day, such regulatory science research can benefit whole categories of products or domains of research and can serve as the true translational bridge from an important discovery to a product that will change lives. And without focused, informed attention to this, the integrity, value, and return on investment of our systems for biomedical research, product development, and ongoing product assessment and oversight for both food and nutrition and for medical products will be seriously compromised. And I think this is an arena where, in fact, the work of epidemiology also has a critical role to play. One certainty for FDA is that it must always be building out its evidence base. But for any given decision, how much evidence is enough? What kind of evidence? Who collected it and under what circumstances? What is an acceptable level of uncertainty? These are all questions that complicate the job of the FDA. And these same questions, this same predicament, is not lost on those of you in the room, those working in settings like the CDC or state and local health departments or in other areas of public health and medical care. It's a struggle that we all share, no matter what aspect of public health you're pursuing. Certainly, it's foundational to the EIS program that thoughtful investigation, careful data collection, and rigorous statistical analysis, the scientific process, must underlie problem solving. Anecdotes, wishful thinking, and powerful personal or professional convictions cannot substitute. And if I want to be snide, I would add uh, polling data or other vested interests. Sometimes we have all the data that we need, but other factors get in the way, and certainly Plan B was one example. But unfortunately, we don't always have all the data that we want or need at the time that a decision has to be made. And sometimes there's intrinsic uncertainty. I'm sure that Tom and his team didn't have anywhere near the information they wanted when recommendations about the risks of travel and pregnancy were being called for in the early days of Zika. In a very different context, we face similar dilemmas working together on foodborne and other product-related outbreaks, when to pull the trigger and initiate a recall, and questions of, is it too soon or too late? too aggressive or not aggressive enough. And on medical product evaluations at the FDA, we always felt pilloried between two extremes, two speeds of approval, too fast and too slow. We wanted too much data or not enough. We accepted too much risk or not enough. The pendulum historically tends to swing back and forth. But the main struggle in this regard that I had to cope with was the perception that FDA was the barrier to innovation. And I think this was spurred on by the anti-government, anti-regulatory climate um, that we are working in today as well. But it, many believed that it was our cumbersome and bureaucratic requirements that were preventing all kinds of treatments and cures 
from flying off the shelves uh, to the patients and public that needed and wanted them. But believe me, for example, it's not FDA's excessive regulation and unduly demands for data that's preventing effective treatments for Alzheimer's disease, as some have claimed. The problem is gaps in the science. We don't adequately understand the underlying mechanisms of the disease, how best to target therapies, and even how to diagnose it, particularly in the earliest stages. Nonetheless, the FDA continues to face calls for lowering regulatory standards and for other forms of deregulation in order to advance innovation. But let me stress, especially in the context of integrity in science, that rigorous science is not an obstacle to innovation. It's the foundation for real innovation. We sometimes forget that in the race to find new treatments or interventions, but innovation is only meaningful if it works. If we rely on sloppy or inadequate science, we may get new products onto the market more quickly, but we'll have no idea whether they really work, whether their benefits truly outweigh their risks to patients or whether they're better or worse than existing products. And frankly, in this era of cost constraints, who's gonna to want to pay for these products? Hovering in the background of some of these debates is the considerable and legitimate concern these days about the reproducibility of scientific research studies and evidence. In fact, I think if you read uh, the media, you'd think that science in this country was in the midst of a replication failure crisis, um, but I think we need to respond with care. For the FDA, few things matter more than data integrity and the quality of evidence used to make regulatory decisions. FDA makes very significant decisions for people and for society. Moreover, many FDA regulatory decisions end up in court with challenges to the evidentiary standard. For these reasons, great attention is paid to data and its sources, and care taken to review, analyze, and compile the available data with the utmost rigor. One little known fact about the FDA, and in my view, one real strength, is that the agency actually requires review of the patient level data for clinical studies that are part of a new drug approval application. This means that you're not relying on someone else's analysis and presentation of the findings with all the possible attendant concerns. FDA has a very specific legal regulatory framework for evidence standards and decision making, but many of the challenges that we face are no different than those you have working in other public health agencies or in academia or elsewhere. Trust and confidence in the reliability of the data and the level of certainty about the findings really matters when assessing problems and making decisions. But stepping back a bit, several important issues emerge from these discussions about research replication, data quality, and the presentation of findings. And I suspect that some of these issues may be on your minds as well. First, I do think that we must guard against the tendency of some to immediately conflate replication failure with fraud or falsehood. Especially in areas of complicated or emerging science, failure to replicate may have to do with getting some of the basic conditions and techniques right. It may have to do with inconsistencies or differences in systems or settings. It may have to do with flaws in study design or interpretation, which raise broader questions about study findings, or it may be deliberate fraud. I'm not saying that any of it is good, least of all data manipulation or outright fraud. But whatever the cause, we must continually strive for better, more transparent, and reproducible data. The best way to address it is to delve more deeply into the scientific questions at hand. But I worry that for some, the rush to judgment is intentionally or unintentionally diminishing the value of evidence. I think that we're also increasingly confused about the role of failure. Failure comes with the scientific process. Hard to imagine a world in which we could have great breakthroughs and discoveries without some failure along the way. But our systems aren't designed to accept this. 
Success, not failure, is rewarded. And so much so that negative studies are generally not published or shared, and information with great value for future research or other actions doesn't get shared. At FDA, there are actually legal constraints that prevent information about why a product did not get approved. It can't be made available without the express permission of the company, who often doesn't want to do so. But sadly, what this really means is that broader research community can't benefit from important insights and sometimes later R&D efforts head down dead ends that could have been avoided at the expense of money, time, and most importantly, patients and public health. So we're not building systems that really serve to advance science in critical ways and that ultimately help to better deliver that science in the service of the public. So one last thought in this domain. We must find ways to more effectively share data. In some instances, data sh sharing will help to verify earlier findings and will help address the problem of research integrity, both replicability and credibility. But enhanced data sharing can also foster additional scientific progress and better use of existing studies. Important secondary research questions using existing data can be examined. Or as new scientific insights emerge, shared clinical databases may enable the use of data mining to go back and look at critical questions like subgroups of responders based on a particular marker or those that are more likely to suffer serious side effects. Meta-analyses of shared published data done right can elucidate new recognition of safety concerns, further information about how well a treatment works, and lots and lots of other important contributions. I'm not naive about the complexity of data sharing in these undertakings, from patient consent and privacy issues to developing the data use tools, standards, analytics, and agreements that are needed, to the operational questions of data control and access, authorship credits, quality control, and financial support needs. This is not a straightforward task. Nonetheless, it clearly represents an evolving and important advance in the conduct of research and one in which we all must participate and make sure that we do it right. But you are all the data experts. With the training and experience the EIS program has provided, few understand better than you the importance of data, how best to collect, analyze, and act on it. Despite all the uncertainties in the world around us, one thing for sure is that your skills will be needed. Public health epidemiologists will be called on to address persistent and emerging challenges, and you'll be needed to study some of the most complex problems of our day. New analytic tools and approaches will expand your repertoire, just as the dimensions of the problem before you will also grow in scope, complexity, and likely urgency as well. You'll be asked to work across disciplines, sectors, levels of government, and across borders. But whatever the setting and whatever the task, I trust that you will bring to it both the scientific rigor and the responsiveness that has long characterized the EIS, and that you'll do it with integrity. Thank you. All right, now is the period for equal time for discussion, right? Alan Block, EIS uh, 1980. I'm a big admirer of you and Tom for the outstanding job you did on MDR TV in New York City. Uh, my question on data for action relates to uh, multi drug resistance uh, relating to uh, livestock products. When the question is always asked, uh, what drugs were given to these livestock? The answer is uh, we couldn't find out. The uh, livestock owners don't have records. And it's, it's like we're, we're being stonewalled. And I think we may need to have some input from people outside of uh, the public health service. 
And uh, for well, example, can litigation. I, can I just respond um, to what is being done? Um, because I think you raise a set of critical uh, issues and how best to intervene um, and probably the need for interventions on many levels. But real actions are underway with respect to the use of antibiotics in um, the um, animal husbandry area, the raising of, of livestock. FDA is in a process of um, making it illegal to use uh, antibiotics of importance for human health, uh, for prevent, uh, for um, uh, growth purposes in animal populations, um, and that's a very, very important first step. Secondly, uh, the use of antibiotics in animal populations is coming under the oversight of the veterinary community in a way that, as you point out, it hasn't been before. As you probably know, um, antibiotics are delivered very differently in, in the for, farm and animal husbandry context than in the human context. And uh, there really hasn't been uh, adequate, adequate information about uh, what's being used by whom and to treat what, because it's, it's combined in the food and you could just go to the store and and basically buy it. So that is now being brought under the oversight of uh, veterinarians so that we will be able to have much more definitive, definitive information and hopefully you know, a much better sense of what's going on as we are seeing uh, the use of antibiotics for growth promotion being phased out. Importantly, also, there are efforts underway to strengthen the ongoing surveillance of the linkage between use of antibiotics in animal populations and human populations and patterns and trends in antibiotic resistance. And that is a, a coordinated effort involving CDC, FDA, and USDA. It's an underfunded domain. Um, and I hope, I don't know what happened in terms of some of the recent budget requests in that area, is an area where ad advancing science can help us do a better job in terms of molecular typing so that you can really track better, because it's been hard to really define in some instances the relationship between the use of antibiotics in animal populations and the actual development of resistance um, that has affected human populations. But work is going on in that area. There'll need to be more. I think that there is newfound recognition and attention to this problem, which hopefully will translate uh, not just into announcements of concern, as we've seen for many years, but also real sustainable action that targets um, where changes need to be made. But I think there is progress. My Let's question go to the is, next question. Um, so we have time for everyone, please. Let's go I, back uh, here. Thank you uh, for your presentation and your frankness. Uh, Conrad Hayashi, Division of Preparedness, Emerging Infections. Uh, for many years, there has not been any means of really assuring that food supplements, vitamins, etc., are not just uh, not harmful, but really provide any significant benefit. How do you see the potential for moving forward so that there is any sort of true data-driven proving of effectiveness yeah. uh, for American consumers? Well, this Thank is you. an area where FDA has an oversight role, but limited authorities in terms of um, aspects of product uh, regulation that are seen in domains such as, as drug review um, or medical devices. I would say the American people believe that dietary supplements are reviewed by the FDA just as drugs are. Um, but in fact, the law gives FDA um, authority, and the law is fairly recent, I would add, as well, but authority to um, do inspections for good manufacturing practices and the law requires that serious adverse events be reported 
um, uh, to the company and to the FDA. Um, but certainly, we have seen many, many concerns with dietary supplements, ranging from them not actually containing what they purport to contain, to containing products, sometimes serious drugs, that they don't list and shouldn't have, and the consumer doesn't know that they're getting. Um, in an increasingly globalized world, many of the dietary supplements are coming from places where there are many fewer standards and um, measures uh, to assure production quality and safety of supply chains, and that adds an additional dimension of concern, and many of the dietary supplements are coming um, in whole or in part from outside the borders. So it is an area uh, where I think continuing uh, data about the types of concerns and the impact on people and populations um, may lead Congress to, to take an additional look. In the meantime, I think it's important for work to continue to be done so that we have data to work with. Um, and I think the public does need to understand that there is a, a different regulatory framework for dietary supplements. And the, the assumption that many have that they are subject to um, a level of scrutiny that they aren't. And also, there's a lot of belief that they're sold in health stores. They mm -hmm. must be good for you. Um, so it, it, is, it is something that has been um, an important issue for the FDA over many years. It's an area that has been quite controversial because there are many people who feel very strongly that the level of oversight of dietary supplements as it stands is enough or maybe even too much. So it fits into what I was talking about, that the world looks different to different people. But I think that it is certainly of concern. Thank you. Hi. My name is Matt Carter. I'm EIS 1983. I've worked for a state health department for over 30 years. My question is, as, as you know, there are many epidemiologists in training in this room. Um, it may not be a surprise to you to hear that there's been a number of times in my career when I've been told that epidemiologists should do the science and turn the science over to the policymakers. And I wonder if you have a perspective on the role of epidemiologists as policymakers. Well, I think you know that it's very hard to completely tease out and do the science and the policy in isolation. I'm a great believer that um, good policy is informed by the science and by the scientists who understand that science. And you can't just pass a study off that's been published to a quote unquote policymaker and expect them to really understand how to put it in context, how to assess it in terms of the adequacy of that science for the problem at hand, and also to understand the context for implementation. So I, I think that you know, as you're doing science, you're inevitably touching on issues of policy. I think it's, it is important, and I suspect everyone in their EIS placements have already been exposed to the fact that much of the scientific and epidemiologic work is intimately intertwined with its policy implications. So, you know, I, I think they go hand in hand. Um, uh, I think the critical thing is I do not like to see policy that isn't informed Thank by you. science and the data that's available. Thank you. Um, David Bell, Division of Viral Diseases, EIS 1979. Um, first of all, thank you for such a magnificent talk. Um, so inspiring, um, touched on so many topics uh, insightfully, articulately, uh, concisely. It was just magnificent. Um, my question is a, is a more general question of um, Conrad's. Uh, how do you respond to people who believe sincerely um, that it should not be, um, that FDA should not be able to deny approval to products based on failure to show efficacy. 
um, safety they they might well agree with but um, the idea that a product should be prohibited uh, because mm, some expert committee or somebody didn't think it was effective um, maybe that should be an advisory opinion or something even these dietary supplements they do say something like not um, not evaluated by FDA in minute print. I agree with you, people don't quite get that. But, but there are genuine consumers who really just think that should be advisory. And I, 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 how do you address, yeah. I'm not talking about insurance companies who won't pay for it, I'm talking about yeah. the average person who wants to be able to buy or drug or physician order something. I mean, it's a huge, huge issue, and it certainly is part of the debate today. Um, you know, there are proposals that FDA should only do the initial safety studies and then move the product into the marketplace and let the marketplace determine whether it, it actually works and people should be informed of the risks and if they're willing to take them. Um, you know, it's their choice. You know, I do think that history shows that the role of a regulatory agency like FDA in assessing safety and efficacy and quality of the product uh, really matters. That um, if individuals are willing to take on, on risks of an unapproved uh, drug or a, a drug where the efficacy hasn't yet been proved, there are some mechanisms to um, get access through compassionate use um, kinds of opportunities. But to move a drug into the marketplace without really understanding the risks and benefits to patients has caused great harm over, over many years. And the public doesn't, you know, you say uh, we'll take on the, the risk and if it doesn't work and we're willing to pay, but still it's, it's not the case, and I'm trying to avoid sounding patronizing, which is what the FDA is always accused of, but, but it is very hard to, to actually as an individual or as a healthcare provider make many of these assessments. And you can imagine in individual cases, it's easy to say, okay, the drug may not provide any um, measurable benefit, but there are no other treatments and it can't do harm. But if you introduce that as the standard of practice across the board, you know, I think you're, you're opening it up to snake oil salesmen, to harmful products, to um, an era that we know, in fact, not only didn't produce health benefits for patients, but also didn't encourage scientific advance and innovation. It was really when the FDA was given new authorities a little over 50 years ago to actually have an efficacy standard and a safety standard that you saw clinical research advance dramatically. You saw the pharmaceutical industry adopting new standards and practices. And in fact, you saw the pharmaceutical industry um, becoming the most admired um, uh, industry in the world in the United States because of the standards and authorities, not most admired in terms of how they always do business, but I mean the, the level of, of, um, of quality, the ability to, to produce innovative drugs, and um, the ability to actually produce things that make a difference for patients, you know, really did change dramatically. But it's not an easy question uh, to answer because if you're the, the patient with no other option or the parent of a patient with no other option, and the drug might help even if it's unproven, or you're in the midst of a crisis and there's something 
but a, an, a drug without proven benefits isn't always better than nothing. And you, know, you also see instances where patients don't get other treatments that would have benefits or harms that weren't initially recognized emerge with broader use. Peggy, thanks for a wonderful presentation. I and saw I, you cut the line yeah, there, I know. by the way. <laughs> <laughs> when, when I got this job, Peggy asked me, are you going to still do the things I tell you to do? And I thought to myself, did I ever? <laughs> uh, but yeah. <laughs> I, I actually wanted to follow on that question, one, one thing, that to think a little bit more philosophically about data, picking up on some of your comments on science, implementation science, and the knowledge that's out there with things like post-marketing data. We, we uh, see this issue commonly in public health, where we can see sometimes an inappropriate uh, deification of the RCT, even where it's not the most appropriate methodology for uh, a specific question. And on the other hand, with rare diseases, for example, the possibility, if you could get actual granular information on what was done to individual patients, you might come up with a reasonable way forward that would be uh, an appropriate way if we had a collaborative way of getting standardized information monitored. So the question really is how can we think about the standards of evidence and types of data collection in a way that will advance uh, both the regulatory uh, approach and clinical and epidemiological care. Not, not easy, I think a, a clear challenge, and yet something that we don't often explicitly address. We think of uh, the errors that we've seen with, for example, estrogens and uh, use of ecological data that led to an inappropriate recommendation. But we miss the number of questions we're not answering because we're not looking at some of the data that might be there for the, for the analysis. Yeah. Well, I think this is a time of really thinking in new ways about data and much less rigidly than we used to. And that doesn't mean stepping away from scientific rigor, but it means applying science to different kinds of data and in new ways. Certainly um, at the FDA, you know, there's been a very big push towards a much more um, innovative uh, set of clinical trial designs, much more use of observational data, um, historical controls. Um, epidemiologic data, of course, has always been an important part, especially on the safety side. But, um, and as, as electronic health records and other kinds of databases become available, also thinking about how to use those in new ways. I mean, it's surprising to me how many people actually believe, even sometimes CEOs of, of um, pharma and biotech companies that FDA will not approve a drug unless there are two RCTs. You know, that just is simply, you know, not the case. But the RCT did develop as, you know, the gold standard for how to ask and answer certain questions. But the truth is that the realities of the world and also advances in understanding um, enable much more flexible approaches and much more um, Emphasis is now being put on um, adaptive clinical trial designs and Bayesian statistics on uh, how to uh, more effectively uh, use existing databases, either with meta-analyses or um, data mining to ask and answer additional questions to better utilize um, existing uh, data. And people are thinking very hard about how to push certain kinds of clinical trials out much closer to where the patients are because of the opportunities that electronic health records um, can offer. I mean, one of the problems is you start to think about this broader universe of, of data and ways of doing things is that the, the rigor of the initial data collection becomes even more important, something that I think all of you in this room probably understand profoundly that, you know, if electronic health records are reflecting very different ways of um, defining cases and um, tracking uh, information, then when you put it all together to ask really important questions, it's actually not going to give you the answers that you need. But I think this is a time of great ferment and opportunity in this realm and where people trained in data science 
such as so many of you in the EIS program, can, can really help with, with new thinking. And um, you know, certainly, um, I see Anne sitting here, um, you know, thinking about vaccine trial designs um, during the Ebola outbreak. Um, it was hardly as though you know, the FDA had the only um, perspective and, and uh, scientific and real world experience to bring to bear on what kinds of studies could and should be done to help advance critical uh, scientific questions so that, in fact, important actions could be taken if the data supported the use. 